Howdy everyone. The sponsor of today's episode is Ledger. Genuinely love this company. I've been working with them for a really long time. You're going to be hearing all about them from me later in the show. But for now, on with the program. What's up, everyone? Uh, welcome back to another roundup edition uh, of On the Margin. Extra special episode today. We got Jack and Mark here. What's going on, fellas? Doing great. Doing great. great. Happy hodl days. I got my, my <laughs> green and red going. And just before we start, right, I got to do it, right? I'm going to stand go. up. Let's do it. And uh, we got the the Bitcoin Citadel. So, Let's go. you know, join us if you want to escape the ravages of the fiat fiasco, come to the Citadel. <laughs> Mark, I got to, where do you get these socks? And these are like the best socks I've ever seen. Mount Socks, baby. At Mount <laughs> Socks. Mount Socks. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right. No, no, uh, no financial affiliation, but yeah, definitely go check Actually, it out. Actually, no, I mean, they send me, they do send me a gifty every now and then, but no financial, mm. I'm not, I'm not a paid sponsor. They, mm. they sent me a couple pairs. You're, you're their number one customer, them. but other than that, no, no. Yeah, I might be their number one customer, <laughs> but um, mm. they are, they're good, they're good, good friends. And, and I think they do good work, but they're, they're in the business. Uh, this is a side hustle, but uh, good <laughs> they guys. seem like they're good. Good, good guys and gals, them. actually. Guys and gals. So I say guys, I mean both. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Anyway. Cool. Mark, I've, I've been thinking about Christmas gifts for you. I think what I'm going to do, I got to get some apparatus where I don't feel the anxiety of you climbing up on the chair. I'm deciding between like some sort of mattress. <laughs> yeah, like a little, like, like, no, a little, like a little <laughs> camera that I could go down. It's like a, like a, like a, a shower nozzle. I could take the camera and go anywhere. <laughs> That would be much better. See, this is why we need each other because I'm here. I'm thinking like a mattress. I'm thinking like some sort of gizmo where you like plug yourself in and there's like because a harness. Because you and a are a risk manager. It, it's like my wife. She would come and say, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, all right, guys, let's just get into it. We're going to flip the script today and actually start with stories. So we've got some really good stories for you. We got Trump talking about uh, cryptocurrencies. Um, we've got uh, Jack Dorsey talking about Web3. I've already said I'm triggered by this, so I'm abstaining from the conversation myself here. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, the Turkish lira and what Erdogan is doing to actually prop up the currency, which I think is, just from an intellectual standpoint, purely fascinating. Um, but let's start with Trump. Uh, so I'll give you a little bit of background here. So he did a, an interview with uh, Fox News recently. Uh, his wife, uh, Melania, is launching an NFT uh, platform or a series of NFTs on Solana. Uh, you know, whatever. Uh, go check it out. Do your own research. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about that one way or another. Um, but uh, after when he was on the interview with uh, Maria Bartomo, uh, she asked him about um, – what does he think about cryptocurrencies more broadly? Trump says, quote, I never loved it because I like to have the dollar. I was never a big fan, but it's building up bigger and bigger and bigger, and no one is doing anything about it. I want our currency called the dollar. Uh, and he warned of an explosion, the likes of which we have never seen. Whatever you think of our ex-president, he has a flair for the dramatique. <laughs> what do you guys think about this? Ah, uh, look, as you said, he has a flair for the dramatic. Uh, it's, it's all a show. Um, but look, I, I think his commentary on Bitcoin, crypto, anything is about as useful as Hillary Clinton's. Um, and enough said. But it's worse than that, right? I mean, when he says that, that he wants a strong dollar, yet everything he did in his four years in office was about weakening the dollar. And, you know, it's, I don't know, there's, there's the political stuff and then there's the economic reality. And the political is, I want a strong dollar. That sounds great. And look, every great economy in the world has had a strong currency. Uh, banana republics have weak currencies. And if you look around the world, uh, we're in a race to the bottom with every major Western nation weakening their currency as fast as possible. Says, oh, no, no, Mark, the DXY is up this year. Mm. Right. That means because the euro and the yen, so crazy Kuroda San and Lagarde, <laughs> are just better money printers than Powell. So, yes, we are the least bad of the bad three. Um, and we're no Turkey, which we'll get to. But we are weakening the currency, and that is a sign of economic weakness, not strength. Yeah, well, I, I saw uh, President Biden also said some nice things about former President Trump, saying that you know the prior administration did a lot of great things discovering the vaccine. And I saw in the interview, President Trump took that 
uh, to heart. And he said, you know, Joe Biden, I'm not going to say some bad things about him because he's been saying some very nice things about me. So I only, you know, if only the CEO of Bitcoin had been saying some nice things about Trump, maybe he would have come out with a different tune. <laughs> where, where is that guy? The CEO of Bitcoin. He's yeah. totally absent, absent at the wheel. I well, you seen know, from a- Michael, to, to that point, right? Remember when they had the, the Senate hearings and they had Zuck up there and the the joke was that, you know, they subpoenaed the CEO of Bitcoin, but they were unavailable. So, um, <laughs> yeah, they, they didn't show. I yeah, I mean, it's it's it is funny. I mean, we talked about this last week, Mark, um, in general, and actually uh, just I, I actually brought this to our, the, the attention of our editorial team. And I was like, look, I think we should do some sort of coverage on what looks like it's happening is that crypto is becoming politicized. It seems like the GOP is lining up in favor of it. It seems like the Dems are lining up uh, anti. And they actually pushed back on me. And I thought they had some really good points. Uh, you know, they pointed out, um, uh, you know, there are a couple local representatives in like the state of Illinois, uh, Democrats, uh, which mm-hmm. were actually very pro Bitcoin, mm-hmm. um, Eric Adams uh, in New York. Uh, and it really made me think. It was like, man, maybe I'm guilty of the same thing that I always, <laughs> you know, poke fun at other people for. I'm just reading headlines here, and my mind yeah. is jumping to quick conclusions. And actually, the truth is much more nuanced and complex. Um, so, well, but I, I think I think it's both, right? You know, an individual can make their own decisions, and there, are, you know, five hundred and what is it, five hundred thirty-eight of those individuals uh, that that get to choose. And so, yeah, a couple people. Uh, sometimes the exception proves the rule. So I agree with you 100% that at least right now, the GOP is trying as a way to get younger voters because uh, they've been the old person's party forever. Um, they've been trying to to be more crypto hip. Uh, but that's also not 100% fair because part of it is just, turns out, you know, Senator Lummis happens to be Republican. I think you know, be Caitlin Long and all the effort of, of the other people in Wyoming to make that a crypto friendly haven. I think Senator Lama said, bring it. OK, I'm going to I'm going to jump on this horse and ride to stay with you know, Wyoming and cowboys, um, cowgirls. But uh, so she happens to be Republican. I, I don't know that that was part of their big. But, but I do think they meaning that party saw that Gen Z in particular is very much crypto native, digital native, and you know, trying to appeal to that group would be favorable. Mm. Yeah, really interesting. And not to I be have, a little I, bit of, of a pedant, but uh, I, yeah, I think the argument, and you, you're right, Mark, that Hillary Clinton made the ex- exact same argument, that the argument that Bitcoin is a big threat to the dollar, it's no longer really in vogue. I, I think you've, you know, you like, uh, the, the, the Bitcoin is likely not going to be a means of exchange for everything on the planet in the way that the, the right. dollar is. It's a lot more people see it now more as a, as a store of value. If anything, it threatens, in my view, the emerging market currencies. And you sort of see like El Salvador on one end totally embracing it, issuing volcano bonds, and then Turkey on the other end where they actually banned Bitcoin because uh, you know some wealthy people who want to mm. uh, get money out of a, a currency that's, that's underwater – Put, put money into Bitcoin. And I actually think that Bitcoin's you know huge surge in the summer of 2020 uh, co- coincided with uh, the the real start of the, the, the pain in the lira. Mike, sorry, what, yeah, did you say something? But, oh, sorry. No, but, but I think what's interesting about this is um, hmm. yes, yes, and yes, in the sense that uh, Trump you know, is always just going to throw out as many buzzwords as he possibly can. What's what's I think he like goes on Google and see what's trending <laughs> and says, oh, NFTs. OK, we're going to do an NFT. Uh, oh, metaverse. I should say metaverse. Oh, Bitcoin. OK, uh, the dollar. But here's the thing. You're absolutely right, Jack, that the what what Bitcoin is today clearly is digital gold. Right. It is the citadel back to the socks. It is the fortress from which you can protect yourself against the ravages of fiat devaluation around the world. And I agree with you that it's not going to be a medium exchange. We're not going to use it to buy coffee because what we will use is the payment rail that is the Bitcoin blockchain using the Strike app or others, uh, investor in that, by the way, that you can buy coffee uh, using fiat across the rails. Now, what's really interesting is that's the near term, because in the in the near term, what Bitcoin is, is an asset 
to your point. And Nat Brunel was on TV talking about this, and I thought it was a very nice piece, uh, that it is like gold, right? Gold is a reserve asset. It also has elements of currency. It's the only commodity currency. Uh, I mean, silver a little bit, but not as much as gold. Uh, palladium doesn't have it. Copper doesn't have it. Magnesium doesn't have it. Um, Bitcoin is that. It is both commodity, asset. It's a digital commodity. It's an asset. But it also has monetary use cases that could, could evolve over time. But it is money, right? Gold is the only money for the first 5,000 years. Bitcoin will be money for the next 5,000 years. And what money is, is it's something that exists in the absence of a liability. Everything else is currency. It's not money. Dollars are not money. Yen are not money. They are currency because they have a government liability attached to them. And so, uh, as JP Morgan famously said, right? You know, gold is money. Everything else is just credit. <laughs> and that is truth. And so the next wave is for central banks. We've already seen a couple of them to adopt Bitcoin as a reserve asset, as part of their portfolio that backs the liabilities, in theory, uh, for their currencies. But then there is an argument, and Murray Stahl, and, and we should have mm. Murray come on sometime and talk about this. Murray yeah. has a very right. elegant argument why the next step is that Bitcoin subsumes. It becomes the, the gold hole uh, or orange, I guess, orange hole uh, that sucks all of global M2 and it does become currency. Hmm. I can't argue I, with his logic, but I think it's it's a ways off. I, I, I you know, I, I completely agree with you, Mark. I also think, you know, just to, I, I think to wrap up a couple of what we, uh, points that we've been saying here. Um, one, I think it's, it is interesting that, uh, you know, on this idea of, <laughs> We're going to bring this up when we talk about our next story, Jack Dorsey. But people tell you uh, a lot about what they really think with how they react. And I do think it is very telling that the two areas that the U.S. is really concerned about in terms of regulating crypto is stable coins and DeFi, which I think is <laughs> really interesting. That's really interesting because like the stated objective of Bitcoiners, if you take people at their word, which I strongly believe in doing um, – is to, is to supplant the U.S. dollar, right? I, I think the most charitable interpretation of that is it ends up being like a it's a neutral reserve asset. Uh, it ch it's a check against uh, you know central bank profligacy. But like the state of the objective of Bitcoin is to supplant the U.S. dollar. Um, yeah, not going to happen. The, by the way. The, just just not. I mean, agree and, and, and again, that's going to make me unpopular with the maxis, but it's not going to happen. It is going yeah. to be an alternative store of value to take a portion yeah. of your wealth and move outside the fiat system. Yeah, and, and also yeah. a lot of maxis, Mark, would agree with you that it's not going to be a, a means of payments. Like M Michael Saylor has said that it's not, it's a threat to digital gold, not to the dollar. Yeah. The Saylor pivot didn't get enough attention. I, I just calling this out, like if you want to put your little tinfoil uh, hat, conspiracy theory hat on, Luke Roman said something in an interview, you can go back like seven or eight months and look, he was on Swan Bitcoin or whatever. Mm -hmm. And he said this thing, which is what Michael Saylor is doing, is conducting a speculative attack on the U.S. dollar. And he was like, uh, he, he himself said, I'm speculating here, but I'm saying the fact that he's allowed to keep doing what he's doing, he hasn't got a little tap on the shoulder, nobody's knocked on his door, says that this is tacit endorsement from Washington. But like two months ago, <laughs> Saylor changed what he was doing, and he's like, actually, I'm for Bitcoin and a strong dollar. And it's like right. that pivot did not get right. enough uh, right. attention. Right. I'm just going to flag. Um, but uh, I want to move on to this next story about Jack Dorsey. Um, and so, okay, so I'll, I'll give you the context here and then I want to tee it up and get you, what you guys think. So Jack Dorsey basically, so first of all, he recently resigned from Twitter, right? A couple of weeks ago. Um, apparently that guy's been bottling some stuff up, <laughs> hasn't been able to fully express what he really thinks. Uh, and he's, he's gone on a little bit of a tweet storm. He, he tweeted the other day, you know, I think he led this, this whole thing off with uh, a tweet that said, you don't own Web3. The VCs and their LPs do. It will never escape their incentives. It's ultimately a centralized entity with a different label. Know what you're getting into. Now, there have been like a whole bunch of different pushbacks and responses um, you know, to this. You got guys like Chris Dixon. You got guys like Eric Voorhees, um, I think, trying to draw out more measured responses. Um, but it would appear that you know Jack is really concerned about things, not, things being more centralized and, and owned by... Uh, VCs that is advertised by Web3. I want to draw the connection as well to what I've seen as like really emotional pushback 
across Web3 and NFTs in general. And there are a couple stories that really stand out to me over the course of the last couple of weeks. Discord said that they were going to, I mean, they teased an integration with Ethereum. For me, that's like the biggest no-brainer of all time because Discord's basically the messaging backbone of every DAO that exists. So to integrate with Ethereum is like, that's the biggest slam dunk of all time. Thousands of people, virul like absolutely not, we'll leave Discord, blah, blah, blah. Uh, U Ubisoft or Ubisoft or whatever, gaming Ubisoft, company yeah. said, hey, we're going to do uh, NFTs. Huge pushback, huge pushback, right? And they're like, okay, they walked it. And I think they actually did release NFTs and like no one bought them. My last piece of evidence, Jason, my co-founder, sorry to throw you under the bus, buddy. He tweeted something out the other day oh. about in support of NFTs. Go, I'll link this in the show notes. Go look at what, he got 5,000 quote tweets. Go look at these responses. It is pure emotional venom. It is like, I mean, it's crazy. He showed me his DMs. And my point is, I'm just seeing a really emotional pushback across the board, Web3, NFTs, this entire idea. What do you guys think is, is driving this? Look, I, I, you know, I actually retweeted uh, Tyler Winklevoss's uh, endorsement of, of Jack and said, look, I may disagree with him, but I'm not going to block the guy because, mm -hmm. one, uh, he's really a genius. Two, he's a great human being. And, and three, um, why would I not want to engage with someone who has been as successful and, and uh, forward-thinking visionary as, as Jack? So I, I came out with my hashtag, back Jack. And uh, yeah, I mean, these people say, oh, I'm going to block him. It's just people of intelligence seek people with different views for dialogue and debate in search of truth. This whole cancel culture thing of, oh, I block anyone that disagrees with me is insane. You should actually, I actually, I was going to tweet this today and I thought, nah, it's probably not. not good. I said, <laughs> I, I, I do this thing where I try, and I'm not very good at it, but I try to practice gratitude, right? And, you know, I, I tweeted last night, was grateful for, for, you know, Dan and Pomp and how they, you know, kind of changed my world vision toward, toward this. Mm. Um, and others, you know, the, the OMGs, as I call them, the old macro guys. <laughs> um, but the reality is that I'm actually grateful for the trolls. The trolls make me such a better investor because mm -hmm. the, the more virulence and vitriol that gets thrown at you about an idea, the better the idea. It's that mm -hmm. simple. If everybody's showering you with flowers and praise, it's a crappy idea. It's already in the price. I love that negative feedback. So the fact that Yano got, got all this, this pushback means probably dead right. Um, and so my view is what, what Jack is saying has truth, but it's a temporal truth. It is no question that any company that starts with VC backing or you know, a, a centralized backing is going to have a meaningful ownership, right? The people who put the original money in any business own a big chunk of it. And then that gets diluted over time. Bill Gates used to own all of Microsoft or most of it, not all of it, but most of it. Now he doesn't own as much. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but the idea mm -hmm. that, that because it's backed by LPs, right? I used to be an LP and now I am a GP and I have LPs and we invest in these businesses. The fact that we invest in these businesses doesn't make them centralized. And I get the part of, well, if they have all the tokens up front, but they don't have all the tokens, they may have a significant portion of tokens. But as long as there's a transfer over time of that, that ownership, uh, and, and the functionality can still be decentralized, even if the ownership is centralized. I mean, Bitcoin, and I know there's arguments all over this on how centralized is it, Let's just face facts. It is still pretty bad Gini coefficient. Was, oh, the Gini coefficient doesn't apply. Okay, then call something else. But there's a whole bunch of people who own a whole bunch of it that they got at zero prices. They have zero basis. It's all gains. And there's a whole bunch of people who would like to own some today, but have to pay you know, $47,000 a coin. Doesn't mean that they're not going to eventually own Satoshis and we'll go to Satoshis and we'll talk about the price of Bitcoin. But... I think the the it's a it's a distinction without a difference for me, and 
And I think all the points Chris made are, are really valid. And But I don't disagree with Jack in the short term that there is this, what appears to be centralization, but digital property rights, NFTs, right? That is decentralized, right? I mean, if, if something is public and can be transferred in ownership in a public ledger, that by its nature is not centralized. You're not going through a central authority to transfer ownership. At least that's my view. Yeah. I, I, I tend to ex exactly agree with you, Mark, and what you just said about, um, you know, when people, when anything, we I wrote a newsletter on this the other day, but basically anything that elicits a response like this is very rarely a nothing burger. Right. Like it, it, anything that, uh, you know, summons this level of emotion, it, there tends to be something real happening here. And one thing that I would uh, posit as an idea, you know, when I look at, you know, each of these three examples that I use. So Jack Dorsey, you know, he kind of focuses his criticisms on, um, uh, you know, VCs and centralization, you know, the NFT crowd uh, or the um, Discord community and the Ubisoft community, you know, they're very focused on like environmental concerns and speculation and yada, yada. Uh, they're, they, they cite different rationalizations, but I feel like the emotional response is the same. And I think what the connection for me is that I think the way that I look at crypto is it's a disruption of incumbents across a whole bunch of different areas, right? Mm -hmm. Bitcoin was the first, it was the monetary disruption. So we have always kind of known this is going to disrupt bankers and central bankers and nobody's crying, nobody's shedding any tears for Jerome Powell or Jamie Dimon, <laughs> right? At the end of the day, like no one really cares, right? But now Web3 is actually disrupting Web2 companies. It's disrupting gaming companies. These are beloved platforms, right? That like, it's like, whoa, I actually like Twitter a lot. I actually like my video games a lot. I'm not really sure if I want this change here. So what I think you're just seeing across the board is a natural aversion to change uh, and principles that people had held sacred. And when I look at a guy like Jack, who's clearly like a brilliant entrepreneur, right? Like Twitter, uh, the, the guy, he's, he's really, really smart. Little guy. company Square Cube. Little company Square. Yeah. Has that one done well? Yeah. We've been like block. It's called Block uh, now. Yeah. Block. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, called yeah. Block now. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think at a certain point, like if I was in Jack's shoes, I'd be thinking one about my own legacy, but also there's this, like he helped write the principles and the ideas of Web2. For him, if I was sitting in Jack's shoes, I would be looking at this like, I'm not even really sure how broken this is, right? Also, I put a lot of myself into this. So weirdly, Web3 is saying we're invalidating these ideas that you've taken as gospel or helped form for the last however many years. And I think that- Michael, I, I, I don't want to I don't want to preempt Jack here, but I, I, yeah. I, I actually was thinking a lot about this this morning mm -hmm. in the shower where I have all your great ideas. And it's because yeah. your subconscious was working on it all night. And I actually had a very restless night because I was thinking about this so much mm -hmm. um, that everything starts centralized, right? And we talked about this on, other, on previous shows is, you know, in the olden days, everyone got their information from the church, right? Full stop. You got your information from the church. You went once a week, they told you what to think, you didn't read, you didn't write, you were kind of a serf and they were the, the, the power. And then the pilgrims left and they separated church and state. Why did they do that? Well, because they wanted to be in power. They wanted the state to be in power, not the church. So they created the state, they created government and government suddenly then got all the power. So the printing press busted the monopoly of the uh, church for a while until it could read, so it decentralized because you could now print and distribute information more broadly, but then it re-centralized around governments, state-owned media. And even though the US had three networks, they were still quote unquote state-owned and got your messaging from what they told you to say. And then the internet busted that, but it's like, it's like gravity, right? You spread the atoms out, but then gravity pulls them back together. And so what happened is, you know, when Facebook started or, um, you know, uh, Amazon started all these things, they, they weren't very successful and they weren't very big networks. But as the network grows and all that data becomes centralized, now suddenly, oh, I don't like what you said. You're deplatformed. Oh, I don't like that point of view. You're deplatformed. Mm -hmm. That is what we tried to kill. <laughs> and so now we're trying to bust the atoms again in the next wave. And so there was web one. 
right? Eh, I like this. And then there was yeah. Web 2. And it's, it's this constant going out and then gravity pulls it back. Because human beings are prone to love power and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And once you get big enough, you, whoever you happen to be, Facebook, Instagram, whoever, you know, Twitter, you get to say, oh, I don't like you, I don't like you. And so now we're going to another explosion. We are going to liberate, okay, into web three, into two, true decentralized. Because this is the first time we've actually had technology to make decentralized apps that aren't really centralizable. So maybe they're owned centrally, but the applications will be decentralized. Mm. And that's cool. I, I think that's cool. I do too. Jack, I know we've really been monopolizing here. Before we no, move it, on to it, the Turkish Lira, thoughts? Yeah, I think one thing that's really interesting about Web3 is that it alters the adoption curves of different technologies. So Mark, you mentioned Amazon. You have network effects there. Facebook, you have network effects there. I go on because my friend is on and they went on because their other friends are on. Uber, you know, you uh, drivers go on because the customers are there and customers are all there because the drivers are there. That is it's definitely a virtuous cycle, but it's very hard to start. And often, as you've seen in venture capital, it requires a ton of money up front, which means that uh, VCs just sort of you know, do a shotgun shell of, of, of all, the, all the money and they, it's just sort of crazy out there. Um, and the idea is that in Web3, consumers can participate, can participate in the growth of, of the network. Um, yeah, I, I really haven't looked that interesting, but it's, it's, it's interesting to what degree, if you have people buying the tokens beforehand, does that uh, change change those those dynamics? But and then then also I'm I'm very curious about uh, is it really VC if you can sort of sell the tokens immediately? I feel like the the lines are very blurry. Well, there's another interesting point here, Michael, and I don't mean to preempt, but I, I it no, just, no, no. just hit me that I think is really interesting. And and this came to me the other day as I was I was out in Vegas at the the big Real Vision event, and uh, which was awesome. Um, and there's nothing better than watching Timbaland talk about taking his board ape and turning it into a media franchise. I mean, it's just very cool. Um, but but what was interesting about that is I was talking with this guy who, like Michael Saylor, bought up a whole bunch of domain names. Right. So Michael bought hope.com and voice.com yeah. and all this stuff. But this guy had bought a whole bunch of domain names and he's been selling them over the past 10 years for huge amounts of money because he, like Sailor, had the epiphany that, you know, the Internet's probably going to be around and the English language is probably going to be around. So English words on the Internet is probably a really good thing. Yeah. And I met this other guy who said he went out and bought all the Ethereum uh, names for all these bands because he was in the music industry. And I thought that was pretty interesting. And I was talking to this other guy over lunch. He said, oh, that is the problem, right? That person is stealing intellectual property. I said, oh my God, oh my God, that's right, right? Aerosmith.eth is owned by Aerosmith, right? Just because you, you thought about it first and went out and bought it, you're a squatter. Like, that's exactly <laughs> right. They have the intellectual property and they should own that, even though they didn't think to buy it. That's different than buying a word like music.com. Nobody has rights to that. So you, if you want to go buy that and then sell it to somebody who wants to use it to build a business, that's cool. So I think the same thing is true here. As I talk about this, look, I, we invested in Uber, in Lyft, in Didi, or well, Quadi before it came Didi, in Ola and Grab. And we made a ton of money for our investors by investing in ride sharing. And I've said this out loud, and now I'm thinking maybe I, I don't really mean this. I've said out loud many times, I even said on the show, that it's going to be awesome that in the future, just because someone wrote code 10 years ago, they're not going to get 30% of the proceeds when I get in a car in the future. Because it's going to be owned in a DAO structure, and the riders and the drivers will own it all. But now I think about it. No, there's intellectual property in a geolocation service application that matches drivers, 
and riders, why should someone get to copy paste that and cut out the original person who thought of it? I don't have an answer, but that, that, that's, it just hit me that maybe that's the same as squatting on someone else's intellectual property. When it comes to crypto, security and custody is paramount. Introducing this episode's sponsor, Ledger, your secure gateway to buy, exchange, and grow your crypto assets. I know I've got a smart audience, so I'm assuming slash hoping that most of you already have your Ledger hardware wallet, but just in case you don't, this is how I think about it. I wouldn't get into a car if I couldn't wear a seatbelt, and I don't operate in crypto unless I can do it from my Ledger hardware wallet. Crypto is really exciting, but it is still the Wild West. There are lots of risks, and Ledger is the easiest way to make sure that you are still protected. And the best part about Ledger is that you don't need to make any trade-offs between security of your funds and utility of your assets because Ledger has Ledger Live, which is a software that syncs right up to your Ledger hardware wallet, and you can do anything that you'd want to do with your crypto assets. You can easily send and receive, you can buy and exchange, and you can get access to staking. And they've actually started to aggregate some of the best DeFi apps and services out there. Two of my favorites, Paraswap, a decentralized aggregator, and they've got Lido for staking. And stay tuned, I'm going to keep you guys updated. They've got some really cool services uh, coming out soon. Ave, Compound, and One Inch among them. So if you take one thing away from this, guys, please, please, please make sure that you're protected in this space. Get yourself a Ledger hardware wallet today and start using the Ledger Live app. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Thank me later. Yeah, these are all things that need to get worked out. I mean, even just like the copy pasta that happens in DeFi, like, hey, so like Uniswap starts a protocol, Sushi launches a vampire attack, literally copy paste the same protocol. <laughs> now they're arguably doing something super legit, but like these are interesting questions to work through. I want to make sure we get to the Turkish Lira uh, and the situation that's going on over there. Um, so basically what's been happening is that, um, so, uh, you know, Erdogan basically has some very specific ideas about how he wants his economy run, uh, which has basically led to, uh, you know, they've had super low interest rates. They're trying to juice uh, investment in business over in Turkey. But what that's had the effect of doing is the lira has suffered um, in terms of, uh, you know, where it trades against the dollar, uh, certainly for the last, um, you know, six months or so. So basically, the, the lira looked like it was in free fall for a little bit there. And uh, Erdogan unveiled a new savings scheme. Um, that the criticism of it is that analysts have described it as a backdoor interest rate rise, which could erode public finances. Basically, um, in layman's terms, my understanding of what of what's going on here is um, Erdogan says, hey, keep your savings in lira, in banks, and whatever the difference is in between the foreign exchange rate and domestic inflation, I will make up the difference. So essentially, he's kind of turned uh, you know, lira in banks into something that looks like tips and it's inflation protected. And he said, look, you don't need to worry about inflation because uh, I've got it. You know, if, if, the exchange, if the FX exchange rate goes against you, I'll make up the difference. Now, this is pretty interesting, actually. This uh, is, this looks like something that if you're deep into crypto, this looks a little like what we call Ponzinomics uh, in general, which is um, we want you to keep uh, all of your assets here. And if you do, it will be better for everyone. Now, the criticism of this is that this looks like an interest rate uh, hike, right? We're trying to get people to put their money in the currency as opposed to other things, but you don't really have the benefit of an interest rate hike. And at the same time, if the FX rate, there's a bit of a game theory component here as well, because, okay, the, the value of the lira has stabilized, right? But you, uh, as a Turkish citizen, if everyone decides to sell, then what that does is it makes the FX rate move against um, the interest rate that's offered by banks, the, uh, you know, the treasury is going to need to print lira basically to make up the difference that they owe people who are keeping their savings in, uh, in banks. And what that does is accelerate inflation and it leads to more selling. So basically, if <laughs> this little system that he has breaks, it's really, really bad for lira holders. But yeah. it also is, I mean, it's just interesting. I mean, what do you guys think about what's going on? Jack? Well, if you, if you look at Turkey, uh, it's sort of gotten it from, from both ends because it's a huge importer of energy. And what has gone up uh, over the past year and a half, uh, energy costs, they're sky high, especially in Europe right now. And then it's a mm -hmm. huge exporter of tourism. You don't really think of tourism as, as an export, but people are bringing dollars in, bringing euros in. And obviously due to COVID, that business has fallen off a cliff. So the external balance of payments is a total mess in Turkey. And that's really the underlying cause of the inflation and add on top of that 
Erdogan has fired uh, uh, every single central bank minister uh, when yeah. they when when they suggested rate hikes. The traditional uh, uh, solution, the tra- traditional way to fight inflation, is to hike bank rates. Erdogan very firm in his belief that that bank rates act- increasing bank rates actually causes inflation, and the way to fight inflation is to lower them. Very non-standard. So yeah, I think this sort of is a is a bank. <laughs> rate hike of another means it's like you know does the shakespeare quote does a bank rate height of a uh of, of by another name smell as sweet <laughs> yeah look i i'm a little more again we always have to have our sinister sta- sinister, sinister saturday. saturday uh uh Let's discussion and uh look it's the dictator playbook 101 and erdogan is is one of the ultimate dictators and what dictators do is they surround themselves with their cronies. Uh, they put all the assets in the hands of those cronies through appropriation and, and theft, and then they devalue the currency. And they make themselves super rich and they impoverish the, the nation. Uh, they make them dependent. Then they go out and hand out free stuff. Uh, it's been going on forever and ever. It's actually happening in the United States as we speak, and no one's paying attention to it. Um, all this discussion of UBI and all that stuff is, is just a way to buy votes and, and you know, you're basically making a, a, a uh, generation of dependence on, on central governments. And it's, it's crap. So I think Erdogan is, is an evil guy. Personally, I, I think uh, he is destroying what, what is one of the, you know, I mean, for years was the center of the universe with the Ottoman Empire uh, until the 1920s. And it's still a pretty awesome place, but you know he's just he's just destroying it. And and I think it's all for personal gain. I think it's it's uh, it's an amazing example of when you look at it from an outsider, you're like, how could anyone elect this guy? How could anyone vote for this guy? Well, it's because he gives them stuff. And this is another example of hey, if you leave your money in the bank, well, let's think about this. This is kind of what China did with banning Bitcoin. Is China's banking system is bankrupt. Turkey's banking system, arguably, closing in on bankrupt. As more money leaves the banking system, the deposits go down. Liabilities are still up there. Liabilities go bad because of Jack's point. Your tourism is down. Your your revenues are down. So the businesses can't pay back their loans. And so the banks have this problem. Well, the only way to solve it, well, there are two ways. You can do what Cyprus did and just steal everyone's deposits. You wake up one day and you, you have 25 cents on the dollar, which... And this is the part, and it just makes me crazy that people don't think about this, right? If you give your money to a bank, that's what you did. It's no longer your money. You have an IOU. You do not have that money any longer. You know, the money I keep at Bank of America is no longer my money. It is Bank of America. Look on their balance sheet. It is on their balance sheet. And I have an IOU that they don't have to uh, honor. And Cyprus... You know, 2012, you woke up, you had 25 cents on the dollar. There's nothing you could do about it. If you're at La Jolla Savings, okay, back uh, in global financial crisis, 2009, you got one cent on the dollar. That was 99 cents on the dollar. So this, to me, is all part of the plan. It's going exactly according to plan. And look at Erdogan's palace. Look at all his cronies. They are super, super well off. The average citizen in Turkey... You know, I have a good friend here at, at UNC, professor. Uh, he's from Turkey. His brother's still in Turkey. His family's still in Turkey. He tells me all kinds of horror stories. Um, mm. And and it's a very sad tale. It went on in Venezuela. It went on in, in uh, Zimbabwe. And it's I said it's happening in Japan, Europe, and the U.S. It's just happening a little bit slower. Mm. Yeah, and it's, uh, sorry, I, I might add that it, it really is financial repression because it's not protecting bank depositors from inflation, it's protecting them from currency depreciation, and it's actually penalizing them if they take money out of banks. So in effect, it, it just structurally, it, it, it increases the... Uh, it, the defense against the lira depreciation. You saw that the lira going from 19 liras to a dollar back down to 11 uh, liras a, per dollar. So in, so it will protect from currency depreciation, but not inflation. So that is kind of like, uh, I mean, it's not like it, that is financial repression. I also, uh, my, uh, Mike and Mark, I want to take your take of Erdogan's uh, statement that 
high it's because of is because of Islam and because for religious reasons that high interest rates are uh, they're they're against that religion, so it's it's just a matter of principle. I mean, I, that that's a good one. I haven't heard one so, that's so good since uh, we worked the latest IPO in 2019 because of Rosh Hashanah. I mean, it's just like you, you make these excuses, you know. So <laughs> as it happens, so I've been tweeted about that. I, I'm on, I'm going on this big uh, binge right now of history podcasts, and it's actually listening to this Tides of History podcast um, on the founding of the Medici bank and the Medici house in general. And they give this really interesting history of uh, banking in um, medieval Europe. And, uh, you know, banking or, or uh, banking, the way we think about it with interest rates and everything that used to have a definition that came directly from the Catholic church, which was usury. And the definition of usury is any amount of interest rate whatsoever. So in a weird way, this is Erdogan taking it real old school, <laughs> like uh, blaming it on this like I mean, the, the short answer is that obviously doesn't make any sense. But the other framework that I have is Dimitri Kofinas, the host of, uh, host of Hidden Forces, really put me onto this idea that is now the lens at which I look at big narratives that get pushed by governments. Governments have a history of blaming. They, they create these big narratives or conflicts that are impossible to solve. So mm -hmm. like the war on terror. When you really think about what that is, what are you – you, that is an unsolvable thing. You're fighting an emotion. Um, yeah. You know, the war on drugs, unwinnable. By the way, we're losing. Uh, you know, so when, when I see now a government blame this, like, big thing where there's no possibility of ever resolving the conflict, I see it as a distraction. <laughs> that's my, that's my no, take on it. It's 100%. You know? that the, that's exactly what it is. And look, governments exist to enrich the governors. <laughs> don't, don't, don't confuse it, right? They don't exist mm -hmm. to help the little guy. Trickle down economics, there's no such thing. It's trickle up. And, and you look at the size of the government in the 1700s, it was tiny, and income inequality and wealth inequality was very low. As the government got bigger into the 1920s, um, income inequality and wealth inequality was the highest. And then from the 20s through the 60s, Government got smaller. There was this kind of, you know, liberation, so to speak, post World War II, and and we had this, you know, more people were, were servant leaders instead of uh, permanent politicians, and and we had the height of of um, bipartisanism uh, at at the the, the Kennedy uh, presidency, and ever since then, <laughs> we've gone to polarization, highest polarization in history. And we have the highest wealth and income inequality in history. And just look around the world, it's, it's the same thing. It's governors, the people who get into power, uh, find a way to maximize their own wealth at the expense of the masses. And they, they pay for that privilege by handing out free stuff, whether it's free electricity in Argentina, whether it's, you know, this special banking account. It's like when... You know, Putin had this problem in Russia, right? His banks were bankrupt and he actually had a, a very clever solution. The guy is an absolute genius. Um, I love this. He basically said to the oligarchs, look, um, I know you have all this money stashed offshore that you got from the back. Because they tried to do it the an interesting way. They gave everybody vouchers. Like everybody gets a piece of all the companies. Then the mafia went around and stole the voucher from everybody. But these guys put all that money offshore. Like, I need the money back. So here's the deal. You bring it back and no questions, no taxes, no jail time. Only one thing, you got to put it in a state-owned bank, so Gazprom. And you got $300 billion to come back on shore and recapitalize the banking system. Absolute genius. And then the, the last part, which I always love, and I think I talked about this one other time, is he said, and just don't run for office. And Abramovich is like, good, I'm out of here. Moved to the UK, bought a football club, date supermodels, great life. Kordakovsky is like, no, I'm going to run for president. He's in jail on a nuclear waste dump just to rub it in. So don't don't mess with the dictators. No bueno. Well, I, I would push back a little bit on, I, I think there's definitely government gone wrong, but I think there's government gone right. And humans, are, I, I feel like we need to live in some sort of hierarchy in general. Otherwise, there's the chaos of... Uh, anarchy, you know, I, I don't know if you know that concept, but it's like, yeah, I, I don't oh, know. Oh, Michael, I, I agree with you. you. You know, I'm prone to hyperbole. I agree with you. I, I know. Um, the last, the last concept that I wanted to get at you guys, uh, with this, this 
this move. Uh, it's very interesting that it, this has got compared like kind of jokingly on Twitter. I don't. Do you guys know the concept of like three apostrophe three, which is basically the idea that if we all just put our money here and don't sell, it will be good for all of us. And it's very <laughs> tempting to look at that idea and say, "Well, that's a Ponzi scheme, my friends." But in a grand sense. That's kind of how economies work and function in general. So there's a, there's a, there's a project in crypto called the Olympus Dow, OM. Um, it's really interesting. Uh, it is either uh, the future of how money is going to work or it's the most elaborate Ponzi uh, of all time. And I'm not 100% sure which one it is. I'm not sure they are mutually exclusive, to be totally honest with you. Um, but basically, the way that it works is uh, you, you know, the problem with liquidity mining in general is that it encourages mercenary liquidity, right? Protocols, they need to bring liquidity online. They offer insane subsidization schemes, right? And then people go and they provide liquidity, but then as soon as they drop the incentives, people leave. So what Olympus Dow said, hey, it would be awesome if we could own our own liquidity. So they pioneered this idea of POL, protocol-owned liquidity. Basically, what they did is say, hey, we're going to incentivize people to put other collateral into our treasury, uh, and you get these own things in return, and we're going to pay you insane APY if you stake it. Um, so it's, it's quite interesting. And now they're, they're solving this issue for other protocols, which is basically allowing them to own their own liquidity. But if you like really, you know, dig into what's going on here, what they want is for you to put a whole bunch of assets in one place. And if people don't sell, then it's literally going to work out for everyone. It's this like beautifully designed <laughs> uh, financial experimentation. And like, I think a lot of people have looked at what er Erdogan is doing and said, Hey guys, if everyone just puts their money in the bank and doesn't sell the Lira, we're all going to be better off at the end of the day. And there's a beautiful simplicity to that in a way. But also it's like this smells like a scam. So uh, – but I think it's kind of cool because there's a lot of financial experimentation that's going on in crypto. And you know, there's that exp expression, can't experiment with uh, monetary policy, can't experiment with economics because like people's lives and economies and all that kind of stuff. But you can experiment in crypto. So it's kind of cool to see – not that it really has happened like this, but – you could imagine a world where some of these experiments that are being run in crypto in a in a low risk way actually start to make their way into monetary policy and governments could look at that and be like, "Huh, that's actually an interesting idea." That was my ramble. Sorry guys, but do you uh do you agree with that idea that some like really fast innovation and experimentation being run in these DeFi networks actually could make their way into broader economic policy, monetary policy? It seems like an interesting idea, but maybe it's just me wishfully thinking. I would say yes, and more than that, I would say that the analogy holds between what's going on with Olympus Dow uh, and Turkey, not even on a judgmental moral sense at all, but just in terms of uh, what's going on, that uh, you're being incentivized to keep your money in a certain place, and if you do that, you'll be rewarded. If you don't, uh, you will be punished. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Mark, what do you think? Look, I, I think it's, it's all well and good so long as then that capital is deployed towards innovation and wealth creation, mm -hmm. right? Money sitting idle is not valuable. And, mm -hmm. and that's why you know, I get in trouble when I talk about this, that I actually believe that you know, fractional reserve banking is one of the great innovations of all time. And that if you look around the world, economies that are strong, have very good fractional reserve banking, back to Michael's history lesson with the Medicis. Um, and do I think the Medicis were really nice people? Not so much, but they were <laughs> very that. innovative and uh, very, and, and, and actually I think created progress, right? Which is the idea of fractional reserve banking is elegant and used appropriately, which is what's appropriately, well, there's some level of turns of leverage where it's appropriate. Once you get beyond that, like Lehman Brothers or Deutsche Bank, it's wrong. But, but the idea is, is very sound. And the idea of just everybody putting their money someplace and then just holding it and, and hoping that, that the price goes up, that, that's, that's it's not even really a Ponzi scheme because a Ponzi scheme would take in new money to pay out the old people. It's just... It's just a hope strategy and hope, I would say it's not an investment strategy, it's a four letter word. And I think uh, if you want to put your money into a pool, a bank pool, a DeFi pool, a DAO pool, there should be a plan to 
lend it out, to use it for innovators and wealth creators, and to keep the, the cycle of, of wealth creation going. Um, because here's the thing, if wealth was created by printing money, then everyone would do it. And for the history of time, those who just printed money without any innovation or economic activity failed. Right? 775 paper currencies in the history of the world, three quarters of them no longer exist. So everybody tried this, oh, I'll just print more. No, you idiot. Then the other person just prints more. I mean, you can't, you can't make wealth by decree. You make wealth by innovation, hard work, you know, collaboration, commitment, team building. And that's why I love my job, right? Is I get to work with founders and, and they build things and, and create incredible opportunity and, and wealth. But this idea that, that just putting your money in a box and watching it and waiting for price to go up, that's just stupid. And then forking it into another one and, make it, and think that will somehow go up faster is even more stupid. So all the forks off Ohm are even more disconcerting. Yeah, I'd also say that a key difference between Ohm and, and what's going on with the Lira is that no one has to have money in Ohm. And it, people who put money into Ohm, it's sort of like they're going to a Halloween haunted house. They have certain expectations. They, they're making the choice, you know, whereas if you're a citizen of Turkey, you have to have your money in Turkish Lira. So you're, it's really sort of against your will. I also, Mark, I want to push back on you. Maybe you were a little bit uh, too harsh on the M Medici family. I mean, after I really like the Medici, <laughs> known for their saying that um, double entry bookkeeping is eating the world. Look, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, and, and I've talked about this, right? I mean, they uh, invented dual entry accounting and they created 800, well, they stole it actually from the brother in the 12th, in the 1200s. Oh, I can't remember the brother's really? name, but literally yeah. they, they went to this guy. I don't know if they like hung him upside down or whatever, but they took it and then claimed it for the house of Medici and and look, and I'm not sure what the what the link to the Rothschilds was because it's a different religious group. But I, somehow there's a link there. Maybe they stole. But but then the Rothschilds perfected, right? They, they started perfect, the first yeah. central bank in in the Netherlands, and then that kind of that crap took off, and now we have the Fed and and all the problems. But dual entry accounting is awesome, and and yeah. uh, but triple entry accounting is better. It's way better. future baby. It's, no, it's, it's just better, right? I mean, dual entry. Michael has a ledger. I have a ledger. I relent him $100. I write down $200. Mm -hmm. Unless Jack Medici here <laughs> says, nope, Mark, <laughs> fix that number back to 100 right? But you got to pay me a uh -huh. fee to be that arbiter. Now we got code. And in code, we trust. Code is awesome. People mm. are mostly awesome. But people sometimes, with the wrong incentives, do things that are bad. Unfortunately. Yeah. For sure. I, uh, I love that we're sitting here seriously comparing uh, Turkey to uh, Olympus Dow um, and <laughs> making jokes about uh, dual entry book, book eating, uh, eating the world. Uh, amazing. Um, I, uh, you know, one other comparison. Oh, actually, you know, if you want uh, an interesting lesson in financial history as well, you can read about John Law and everything that mm. he did with the Mississippi bubble. That guy is arguably right. He arguably wrote the playbook for modern day central banking in general. Um, fascinating guy. Uh, fascinating guy. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. Um, I know you get this holidays. I appreciate it. Um, Mark, it's been a ton of fun. Uh, and Jack, thanks for joining us. We're the three musketeers, uh, officially now. So, um, no, it's been great. Uh, look, I, uh, I said, I, it is the best hour of the week. Uh, I really appreciate, uh, you bringing me into the on the margin family and uh, yeah. i look forward to our excitement in the new year so me too my friend me too yeah Can't wait thanks More guys socks. for letting me tag along it was it was a real pleasure and i wish <laughs> you and yours all the very best for the holidays uh and uh have a good one happy holidays team Cheers. thank you everyone